everybody have a seat. We're going to get started. We have a full program. If you would kindly silence your cell phones as we get started, I'd appreciate that very much. I'm Barb Krauss Blackney. I'm president of ADVIS. And again, I'm really very pleased to welcome all of you to our annual head of school, board chair or clerk, dinner and dialogue program. I am especially pleased to welcome four incoming heads of school that we have with us tonight, although I'm not sure they're all here quite yet, um, for the 2016-17 year. And I'd like, if you are here, to ask you to stand so that we can all officially welcome you to both your school and to ADVIS. Uh, Samuel Hauser of the George School. Samuel, welcome. Carrie Kreese from Gladwin Montessori School. Carrie, welcome. Thank you. Richard Schellhaas from Germantown Academy. Welcome. And Michael Gary, who I don't think is here with us yet, but he is, will be joining us later, and he is the incoming head of school at Friends Select School. So we are very um, excited to welcome all of you to both this program and to ADVIS. And I know that we also have a number of new incoming board chairs with us tonight also, and I'm very um, pleased to welcome all of you to this program, as well as one of um, our heads of school just said to me during cocktail half hour, uh, this is his one must do program a year, it is that important. So I hope all of you will um, take that to heart and make this a repeat event every year. I want to thank the National Constitution Center and the wonderful team here who has helped us to coordinate our event for hosting us this evening. Uh, we've really had a great response and we're very pleased to, um, hopefully many of you took up the invitation to see a little bit of the museum prior to the event. We will be hearing um, some official words of welcome from Jeffrey Rosen, who's the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center um, during our dinner hour. I also want to thank and recognize the ADVIS corporate underwriters for this event. And I'll ask you all to stand briefly, too, as I read off uh, your company's name. Edutech Academic Solutions, and Bob Seger is not with us tonight. We actually had a wait list for this program, and he offered his, last, uh, his seat so that we could move our last person off of the wait list. So we're very grateful to him for that. Um, Fisher and Phillips, attorneys at law. Haverford Trust Company, and Malvern Federal Savings Bank. Will you all please join me in thanking our underwriters? Thank you. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our presenter this evening. Mark Frankel is a senior consultant and partner in Triangle Associates, an international consultancy specializing in higher and independent education helping its clients understand and respond to the challenges of a rapidly changing world in order to stay healthy and best serve their constituents. A psychologist by training, Mark facilitates strategic planning, governance workshops, and leadership development programs in both large and small schools in Europe, Asia, and North America, including top-tier colleges. Mark serves on the board of the Wildwood School in LA and is a frequent presenter at regional and national associations conferences. A longtime favorite presenter for ADVIS, we are very pleased that Mark accepted our invitation to return this year to talk with us about, about both our own regional as well as national trends and to guide us as how to plan for and best manage the change that these trends foretell. So will you please join me in, Mark, in welcoming Mark Frankel. Thank you. Thank you all for it. Thank, thank you, Barbara, for that. And, and uh, to the sponsors, and thank Kevin, our, our audio visual guy here who's manning the microphone. So if you can't hear me, signal him. He can do something about it. I can't. We'll go with that. Everyone sound OK? This works, works for you? Cool. Uh, well, there's a lot of you and, and one of me, and this could, uh, could get to be pretty deadly uh, dull if you don't talk back to it. So I'm going to want to at least stop a couple, three times tonight, invite you to say some things. Uh, but if you have something to say in between my stopping to do that, just jump in. Wave your hand, say something, I'll, I'll get my attention. And we promise we will get you to dinner on time tonight. It's good to catch up with old friends in the area. I've worked with a number of schools in the, in the Philly uh, area and love being here. 
my son went to university here years ago and is now a, is, is an independent school student in St. Louis where I live. I went all the way through school there, is now uh, working in the ad agency business on the West Coast and is off the family payroll for the time. Now, they tell me that he's, they have a tendency to come back onto the family payroll at some point, so we're aggressively trying to get rid of the house so we can have one less, yeah, that kind of thing. Okay. Right. We're going to talk about observations tonight. Uh, we can talk about data endlessly. I'm going to throw a little bit of data in front of you. If you saw the enrollment trends a material that Barbara and the Advis team sent out a while back, you'll see a few of those slides go by tonight. You're welcome to my slides. Uh, I think that uh, Jennifer has them and we'll make a PDF of them and get them out to you so you can have, have copies of those. Many of the slides are from the, the uh, Advis presentation and you'll, you'll get those there as well. Uh, the, the, where I'd like to spend most of our time tonight is talking about what do you do with this stuff? Because in some ways we're all in the same boat and we want to uh, figure out what to do with it more than, than understand it because it's sort of bringing coals to Newcastle to stay dwelling on the data, which you probably already know too well. I uh, also want to acknowledge Al and, and Emily from Pace Boa who were here. Uh, Pace Boa really started us looking at this in the Philly area uh, was it a year ago, uh, specifically in the context of very small schools and what are some uh, survival strategies for them. So uh, you'll see some familiar slides go by tonight as well. well. We'll try to bring it all together for big schools. This is a big group. It's a lot of people. You, you span an area of geography that is uh, very wide from Wyoming Seminary and uh, Mercersburg all the way to the Jersey Shore, Princeton down to halfway through Delaware. So it's a, it's a big space. And to talk about demography in that space is a bit challenging because it does, uh, it, you know, one person's demography might not be another's. Uh, although within your region, there's more similarity than difference. There's a couple of uh, pockets of things that look a little anomalous, and I'll try to identify, compared to the rest of the region, I'll try to identify what those are as, as we go along. But um, I, I want to start with you and, and really uh, what's on, on your minds. So let, let, let's begin with that. Uh, wow, this is just terrible. So far away from you, isn't it? Well, good, it's a, it's a good placeholder for me. I remember what I was going to talk about. So wh what are you noticing in terms of enrollment patterns, enrollment changes in your school? Somebody. Harder to, early childhood's a tough sell right now. Yep, that's something that we're seeing in lots of markets around the country. Um, we'll talk a bit about that. Somebody else? No brand loyalty. Congratulations. Uh, Philly has finally made it to where we've been on the West Coast for a long time. They shop every year. I don't know where parents get the time, by the way, but you know they go to everybody's open house. They're looking at what's on offer in every school, and I don't know who has the time for that stuff, but they do. They're always comparing, and and they'll they'll walk for minor differences that are probably going to be insignificant in the cosmic scheme of things. Okay, brand loyalty. What else? More competition with public schools. How about just more competition in general? You know, we, we see no end to the growth in the homeschool sector, which is probably our biggest, as an independent school universe, our biggest competitor. We just don't know it because we don't interact with those people as much. But the publics are, you know, it's far, hard to compete with free. We've always said that. Uh, what else? Is? Alumni support. Alumni support for elementary schools. It, it's never been terrific. Uh, it, it's getting harder and harder. That's, that's, that's right. It's, it's always a tough one. It's getting harder and harder to find people that remember where they went to elementary school. It's, you know, they're, they're, they really are focused on that university uh, boarding school. There's sort of a batting order here of, of the, yeah. Okay. But that, and elementary schools are, certainly that's what we were hearing with the small schools group last year. What else? Mm -hmm. How's financial aid doing? Going up? So we're buying more students. It's good news. We're getting, you know, we're, it's an accessibility issue, but it's bad news for those of us that are trying to balance the budget and, and pay for this thing unless we've got a tranche of cash out here someplace that we can pull from. Well, the, the good news, oh yeah, hey, Dana. Uh, I mean, it goes deeper and deeper into the year. So back in the neo-Pleistocene era, we knew, when, we knew that we would have our classes filled by what? Uh, 
March, you know, you kind of have a, you knew you're 95% there and that would be it. Now we're seeing seats left open in June and July and the last week of school. So what's happened is that domestic independent schools have started to look much more like international schools. The, the American School of London or the International School of Prague. Those schools never know who's going to show up on opening day, really. You know, they have a, a, maybe 75%, but you always have the families that wash into town over the summer, some families wash out of town or, or for various things. So a lot of what our space in, in the U.S. is having to do is start to plan like them. How do you live in a world where enrollment has a, uh, about a 20% year-to-year swing built into it? It's tough. It's not the way we've been used to think. That's a subtext, by the way, tonight. I'm a psychologist by training. So you're gonna have to be a little psychological with you. And, and one of my subtexts to you is that we've all in this industry got to get different mindware for thinking about what we do. Because the rules we've worked from, the assumptions we've made in the past, the budgeting models we've used, the planning horizons we've used, just aren't gonna work. Because the trends you were talking about and now you can decide if you want to get more to drink or you just want to leave at this point. The trends you're talking about are structural, they're baked in, and they're unlikely to change anytime soon. They will in time, but not anytime soon. And that's, gonna, that's something we've got to get our minds around. If, if we don't, we're, we're just going to have the death by a thousand cuts here. Well, a lot of those things we're going we're to cover, and they're going to be in, in the data. And I do want to get us to talking about options for what to do about it. I ultimately think the, the most use of coming to something like this is for board chairs and heads to have a conversation afterward before they go home tonight. So here's your homework, really, before you leave the Constitution Center, to have a conversation about what did you hear tonight that sparked something that you need to go back to school and discuss with the rest of your board. What would be interesting to get your board and administration sitting around a table chewing on, that, that if, there's, if there's anything that you heard here. If you decide that there's nothing that you heard here, that probably is good news for you. You're in pretty good shape, you can relax, you can chill out. But if there's something that you can take away from this, then, and, and if you want more information about that topic, feel free to email me. My email address will be on the slides. I'm happy to send you more leads on stuff or you know, amplifications to, to any of the data. Uh, what keeps you awake at night? That, that list, the list of uh, things, okay. <laughs> Anything specific? That, yeah. Succe succession planning for. Ah. Okay. How to keep keep the ball moving? Momentum succession planning, both in leadership but through the whole community too. And it that's as important for boards as it is for heads of school. And, and faculty, increasingly for faculty. There's, there's a whole, you know, we, we went through that mass retirement of heads of school a few years, now we're gonna see the mass retirement of faculty coming right behind. What else is keeping you awake? It's, it's getting tough. Um, we're certainly seeing that uh, in, in, uh, in West LA. You know, and people are saying, oh, we're so glad you're on the board, just stay. You know, now, now you're on the board. It's getting harder and harder, harder to recruit people. And if, if we have, which creates a, a dilemma, you know, if we have term limits, then we have a sort of regular recruitment cycle, and we could start raising questions about how many, how much of these models that have worked for us for a lot of time really are going to work in the future. Somebody else, what keeps you awake at night? But by the way, on the board member recruitment, uh, since a lot of the work I do is governance, and I, and I apologize, I sort of have a post-traumatic stress reaction going on right now to the worst, uh, most epic board meltdown I've ever seen. It, it's, uh, it's the first such one that I've seen resort to violence between board members. It, it, it got really ugly. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's, uh, it's bad. Um, so whenever we talk about recruiting, just, just remember, every board is one member away from disaster at any given time. So intentionality about onboarding people is really important. Better to leave those seats empty than to put the wrong person in there. That can cost you a lot. It's cost this school about 12 million so far in litigation, PR fees, et cetera. And now they're going to be looking at a head search. So, you know, no surprise. 
Um, anything else keeping people awake at night? Definitely. Okay. No, yeah, no. Happy to. That's going to be the case study of all time. Um, okay, well, let, let's get into some data. We're going we're to work our way through some numbers in pretty quick order. Uh, this, this is stuff that comes out of the adverse. But first, the question I want you to be keeping in mind is for you, and I, this is my way of thinking about it, so I apologize if this uh, if offends anyone, but I, I think about schools in terms of the wolf scale. You know, where's the wolf? Is the wolf at the door? Is the wolf on the block? Is the wolf around the corner? Or is he in the living room or the kitchen eating out of the fridge? So in your school, you can think about where are we? Are we hemorrhaging? How bad is it? Are we thinking we're going to be hem hemorrhaging? Are things getting tighter and tighter? So where would you put the wolf? Because having a, an accurate grasp on that, on reality, Remember Jim Collins' idea that was all the rage in independent schools a few years ago? The brutal facts, a sober understanding of the brutal facts? That's paramount here. If you, heads of school, board chairs, and your boards aren't sharing a common concept of what the financial reality is of your school, what the enrollment reality is, and what sort of runway you've got to make change within, or the degrees of freedom there, you, you got a problem. You have to get on the same page about that. And that's often where we start to see uh, meltdowns occurring is where there's differential anxiety about these things and differential understanding. So let's, let's look at the uh, eight-year enrollment trends. And again, real kudos to Barbara and the team for doing a fabulous job putting this together for you. It, uh, it, it, it almost doesn't need any narration because it tells the story uh, so graphically. And, and you don't even have to read the graph from the back of the room. You just look at it. So, there's uh, ADVIS schools total enrollment over eight years. Notice, notice anything? Um, th there's actually, weirdly, it's not quite as horrific as it looks in one sense, but it is pretty horrific. It's, it, and you know, the, the, the weird thing is Philadelphia looks, or environs, I know we're talking about a much bigger area, looks a lot like St. Louis, where I live. You got two old cities with very maturing populations and a whole pile of independent schools. You know, we got independent schools on every corner. Every corner that's not occupied by a brewery in St. Louis, we have this independent school on the other corner. So we got numbers that look like this too, and they've been trending down over the same kind of time horizon. Like St. Louis, and we'll see this in a moment, Philadelphia has structural reasons why this is the case baked into the demography in the region and the, and the fact that our market is largely going away from us. But that's all total schools. That's day schools, okay? So if you're a day school and you've been feeling the pinch, that's day and boarding schools, okay? Now, you know why that doesn't look like that? Internationals. China. No China, we'd have a lot fewer boarding schools. Okay? The trouble is, boarding schools, What's going to happen to your demography when there's another six or seven hundred English language schools run by U.S., British, and Canadian schools in China, in Thailand, in Korea that are appealing to that market? And there's about a hundred today, and the Chinese government is looking for anyone who will start one. So it's, a, it's an open season market out there. My question is, how long will that gravy train run for you? The, um, but that's, that's what's kept that number there. It's just a rebalancing of, of who's in the building. That's uh, pre-K or K through 12. So that's the, the pre-K, K of 12 market. Um, it's, it's down. Now, the way the graph is drawn, you know, the, this doesn't go all the way down to zero, so it tends to magnify small deviations, but it's still a downward trend. That's high schools. That's usually, by the way, where the number stays the solidest because you get the sex, drugs, and rock and roll phenomena. That's what parents tell us in focus groups, by the way. The line from a parent goes, some parent, in fact, they, they seem to have the same line with a couple of words different. They say, how bad can elementary school be? You know, how much trouble is my kid going to get in in first or second grade? I'll sit it out, I'll save my money, and when we get to whatever grade they imagine sex, drugs, and rock and roll starting, you know, whether it's middle school, high school, or whatever, then we'll make the jump. That's middle and upper schools actually doing better. Put the middle school to it. 
That's pre-K K to 8 schools. Lower schools. Downward lines. Downward sloping lines. That's Advis land. It's a space in the world we're going to call that kind of Advis land, this region. And for my purpose, I'm going to draw that line at about a 60, 65 mile radius on City Hall here in Philly. Drop a pin dot there, go out, do the sweep. That takes in, by my calculation, 99% of Advis land. You got a little piece out here on a couple of corners that are missing, but that gets, that gets the vast bulk of it in. And in that world, you look generally like most aging, maturing cities in the U.S. And to some degree, you look like the native-born U.S. population in general in that regard. Now, there are some pockets in the country that are looking very different than that. Atlanta, I, I don't know what they do down there, but kids fall out of trees every day. It's, it's phenomenal. You, you almost can't lose by having seats in a school in Atlanta because there's kids to fill them. But on net, people wash into that town more than leave it. So you get new families. They, you need to think all the big schools are there. You got Woodward with 3,000 students. You got uh, Westminster with almost 2,000. You've got uh, Lovett with almost 2,000. Big schools, there's plenty, but there's more demand for that. That's Atlanta, it's weird, it's an anomaly. You got DC, it's always good in DC. It's a company town and the company's hiring. And so people come in and they bring kids with them or they find partners and mate there and have kids and th there's a business going on in DC. New York, Manhattan, go going gangbusters. You can't lose in Manhattan. Now, you don't, you're not gonna have any middle class in your kids' schools, but you're, you can't lose in terms of pop. There's more than enough wealth there for the kids. West LA, where I'm on the board. Uh, the, the, there's always people that wanna live in LA. It's, a, it's a, well, like San Francisco, which is also another good market. Pretty much, you'll find a couple of pockets within your region, it's Princeton. So the Princeton folks down here, did anybody come down from Princeton? They didn't have to, they looked at this and said, oh, near Princeton, near Princeton. That's, this isn't for us. Uh, that's an anomaly, because that's really the edge of the New York market for you, so it, it stays pretty strong. In that, in that space, it's an exurban market, and, and there's lots of train families that around the, hit the train into the city. Different orientation. Everyone else in the market, more orientation to Philly. That corner, orientation to New York. It looks very good in demography. But here, south, east, west, not so hot. In that way, you look like much of the rest of the maturing country. If you really want to see numbers that stink, Get out into rural or semi-rural markets. You know, get into Oklahoma, in Kansas, in Iowa, in Illinois. You know, then, then you're seeing depopulation on an epic scale. So if you're the lone independent school in, in Wichita, it's a different horizon for you right now. So uh, numbers, you'll see the detail when, when you get the slides. I'm just gonna make a couple of points. Uh, your total population in Advis land is growing fractionally at about a 2% or less rate, which at least it's growing. It's not declining. Our total population in St. Louis land is slightly declining for that period of time. When I moved to St. Louis 35 years ago to do my postdoctoral residency, we had about 2.9 million people in St. Louis, metropolitan area. Today, we have about 2.9 million people in St. Louis. That's 35 years of essentially zero growth in a market. So at least Philly's ahead of that particular curve. Let's dissect it a bit more. If we look at households with children age zero to 17, so essentially our preschool, school age market, you're just coming out of a nearly 3% decline in the last five years, and you're going into a margin, a fractional, two hundredths of a point declined over the next five. So households with children flat. But that doesn't mean anything, really. The real question is how many butts are in those households? And then the real question beyond that is, can they pay? So if we look at the percentage of households with children in them, we see a sharper decline over both horizons. So that number continues to trend down although not as sharply as it does, as it has in the last five. And if you get to looking at the school age population by age band, zero to four, five to nine, 10 to 13, 14 to 17, 
you see declines, and this is the really interesting data, you see declines that range from, uh, uh, in, in the next five-year horizon, a 5.5% decline in the high school age population, one and a half in the middle school age, and uh, a, a, a big decline in the preschool age population, about flat in elementary, that are in excess of those aggregate numbers of households. Here's the deal. Even though you're not hemorrhaging households in dramatic numbers, the households you've got are smaller. This is the big takeaway. This is the big takeaway. Take out immigration, and the United States looks just like Japan 15 years ago. Japan's the oldest country on Earth right now. If you know Japanese demography, you know that the population's aging rapidly. Japan, for all intents and purposes, does not allow immigration. So it's essentially been below replacement stage age uh, uh, fertility rate for the past 45 years. As a result, today there are a million fewer Japanese than there were 10 years ago. Trend on another 10, there'll be a million and a half fewer still beyond that. So if, you, if we weren't allowing immigration, those of you who want to get into that debate, we would look just like Japan, where the hot conversation is, Who's going to work and how are we going to pay for this thing called society down the road when, when we're all basically old? But here, the problem we've got is sheer number of kids in the market. Um, the numbers are continuing that downward trend. So left to their own devices, what we would expect to happen is that the enrollment trend line will not go down as sharply as it has in the past. It's beginning to shallow out but it will continue to trend down left to its own devices for the next five years. In fact, if you look at the long-range forecast, because we know demography is cyclic, it will start to rebound in this market, but you're probably beyond eight in terms of when you're going to see that coming back, looking eight, ten, maybe even beyond that horizon. St. Louis, we're probably looking at never, because it would require massive economic retooling and a, a rebirth of industry in town and things that just you, know, you can't predict. At least you have that basis here. So in a market that's viable in every other way, it will come back. Your game is to figure out how to get through what's going to be a prolonged trough of demography. That's the brutal fact. That's what we're going to spend our time talking about. Sorry. Qu uh, any questions at this stage? I've, I've just depressed everybody. But yeah. Yeah, that's our biggest problem, by the way, because if you look at the, um, the people who are likely to have the means to pay for us, they in particular are having fewer kids. The families are growing, but they have one kid or two kids. And, and that, an, that anomaly in there, the numbers or none, are, are really an issue. Um, well, I could go into a whole sociological study here. Uh, th there's a phenomena of like mating that goes on. Uh, and, and what that, uh, that, uh, that assorting, assorting process does is it has us getting like-minded people mating with each other, having fewer kids. They have the means. We're not going to be where they spend it. They're not going to be spending resources on, on, their, on their children because the children just aren't going to be there. That's our likely horizon for a lot of our high-income families. We're going to have to think differently about some things that I'll, I'll put out to you in a moment if we're going to survive this. Some of you will survive it just fine because your school has a runway long enough to do it. Others of us are going to have to think much more carefully about who our market is. It's not going to be that market in large part. They also have more options on where to live. So they can, they can choose to live you know, a way outside the market in a place where there's decent schools, decent public schools if they're so inclined. Uh, this, I, I did this graph. I, just to make a point, uh, this is the concentration of independent school students by zip code in Adbus land. So there it is. That's the concentration. It's, uh, if you know the graphing model, and this is in the NAIS uh, demographics utility. If you're an NAIS member school, you all have access to this. You can run your own. You can do it on the specific zip codes your school draws from. 
But I just looked at this to say, where are kids coming from? And the green, of course, is the top quintile, and then the colors go down from there to uh, the um, purple, which is the, the bottom, and then somewhere in there is a uh, red, which is the very bottom quintile. So basically, green is good in this model. I, I wonder if there was a correlation with money. I'm not sure. But notice anything? You know, it kind of follows, well, here you've got the 95 corridor. So to some degree, it's following that 95 corridor. It's highly agglomerated in the Philly kind of metropolitan area with this little bubble over here to the, to the Wilmington side. So you don't have so much up here, and you really don't have much down here in terms of where the, where the kids are. Private independent school students are coming from pretty much somewhere on this uh, southwest, northeast axis across the market. The problem is going to be that that's not going to, that, that axis isn't going to produce enough kids to keep on populating our schools at their current levels. So our market is either going to be bigger or different. So let's look at the concentration of school-aged children. If you see, that looks different than where they're coming from now. That's the concentration of school age, just 0 to 17, didn't break the band off by a particular age. I said, where are the kids? It looks a bit different in Advis land. Yeah, you got some along this corridor, but the, the run until you get in the Princeton area doesn't look as good. The Trenton area really stinks in that regard. Wilmington still looks pretty good. But you start to pick up some odd pockets of green popping up out in the, the hinterland. Now, you can say, yeah, but there's great public schools out there. Sorry, I, I don't know the public school world. I don't know if there are or if there aren't. But what that tells me is where we got them from, we're going to have to get them from somewhere else. So that's another, another takeaway of this is how are we going to get kids from neighborhood zip codes, block districts that we aren't getting them from today? How do we get to be known in that market? And if the market has a good public school, how, how, do, we, how do we compete well against that? So enough data. Scared you enough. I put it out there. I, I really, I, I, here, here's the thing. I said it's not, it's not as awful. Well, I'll, I'll get to this in a moment. What's not as awful is I believe the high point on that graph, the one back at the beginning that showed the slope in school enrollment beginning right after our, our friend the 2008 recession. I believe that the two to eight years before that point was actually our bubble. We were in a bubble economy in independent schools. We just didn't know it. We thought it was the way business would be. And that what happened is the factors driving the bubble went away in 2008, and they haven't come back and they're not likely to. So that's the takeaway, the bubble. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that a bit in a moment. If that's true, then the graph you're seeing has a, a it will trough out and, and stabilize closer to where historic norms have been decades past, but it won't come back up to the bubble stage until some of the factors that drive the bubble come back. So hang, hang on for that piece. The first, um, powerful forces in the world, okay? this is. Sorry, I've got to say this because it's going to make the point. Compound interest is a powerful force, right? It's, it's, uh, well, Einstein was amazed at the power, according to the reports of compound interest. Gravity, it's been with us always. My backyard is on a hill. It slopes into the university next door to me, and I have a rock wall across. The, in the 30 years we've owned that house, the rock wall's tipped over twice in that backyard. And the last time it went, I told the guy that came to repair it, I said, I want a wall that's not going to go down this hill. Guy puts his hand on my shoulder and says, sir, gravity is a powerful force. It's, it's going to pull this wall down the hill eventually. We maybe get it to stay up longer, but it's going down this hill someday. Human migration, it's what humans do. We move around, right? So it's, it's nothing new. We, we move around. Sometimes we move forcibly, planfully. Uh, uh, traumatically, but humans move. The last is increasing productivity. And this is the force that explains the modern economic world. We've got to come to grips, not only with our demography, 
but with this productivity issue we have in independent schools. It's the third rail. Figure out this one and you will win the Nobel Prize in independent school economics. How do we finally figure out how to do one of two things? Well, we have a third option, by the way, which I'll, I'll explain, but you're going to tell me that's less tenable for mo many of you than others. We've either got to get more students to the same number of adults that we have in our buildings, or we've got to get fewer adults to the same number of students in the building, or we're doomed on the cost curve. No one's solved this one yet because doing so requires doing something that's deeply unpalatable in our world, right? It requires changing ratios. It requires dealing with faculty productivity and workload. That's why it's the third rail. Demography, challenges that come to us from demography are conjoined with the challenges of productivity because we can't remain forever a cottage industry of people turning out a handcrafted product made anew every year for families at any kind of reasonable price. There are handcrafted cars available in the world. You can buy a handmade car. Maybe some of you could buy a handmade car. I can't buy a handmade car because they start at about the half million US dollar mark and go up from there. Imagine what a handmade washing machine would cost. None of us would be able to afford it. So we've got to figure out, is this notion, so that's a, I'm asking a rhetorical question. I don't have an answer. I'm sorry to this one. But I think it's a great one to take back to school and kick around. Is this notion of a handcrafted education made anew for each kid, highly custom for that kid, is that what we're selling? And if it is, then we may have to just accept that we're going to be in a shrinking market that will look very different than it's been in the past because the, and we are not going to reap the benefits that productivity brings, which is we are able to keep our price in some sort of reasonable place. So where we're at, I paraphrase William F. Buckley's uh, famous uh, mission statement for the National Review magazine. Remember the National Review magazine? He said its mission was to stand athwart progress yelling stop. So to date, private independent schools have for the most part stood athwart increasing productivity yelling stop. Can't keep doing that. Our demography, our business model, our economics, and the United States economics are out of alignment with that. And we're going to have to somewhere along the line sober up and face that one. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. Uh, we've been really good at selling small class sizes. You all know that. And so we have a dilemma. And I, I can see the schools sitting in the room. There are schools in this room that could really do something about the small class size phenomenon. They also have zero incentive to do anything about it because they're the market leaders. In Los Angeles, the one school that could change the independent school economy in a year would be Harvard-Westlake because they can get away with it. They got them standing in line back to Cleveland to get into Harvard-Westlake. So if they started changing their ratios, then everyone else in the town would say, well, okay, if they're doing it, we'll do it too, and families would go along. If Wildwood, where I'm a trustee, started changing our ratios, we don't have them standing in line back to Cleveland to get in. So while we have a nice waiting list in our upper school, we'd see that list go away in a heartbeat because people would say, I'm not going to be a school. I'm going to go to Windward down the way. Or I'm going to go to Crossroads and New Roads where the ratios look like they used to look. So market leaders who can actually move this one have no incentive. Another takeaway for Advis from this, for Advis land, is that addressing these problems we face requires collective action. It's not going to work for us to take a, uh, you know, two hikers on the trail trying to get away from a bear 
that, that uh, old, old joke, that just have to run faster than you idea. We're going to need to figure out a solution that allows, as a group, the preponderance of our schools to survive. Now, if you listen to those words, you'll figure out what I didn't say. But I'll say it more clearly in a moment. Triple threat. So now we got tuitions rising at CPI plus two and a half or more, still, because they have to. We have no choice. You know that. That's Baumol's cost disease. We have static or declining demography throughout the whole United States with the exception of those golden markets. And we have proliferating acceptable, I put acceptable in quotes because I think what's acceptable looks very different now to people than it used to. It's different. It's a di different world. Well, why does acceptable look different now? You know, we keep seeing numbers that the United States is a, one of the few places in the world that's in economic recovery. What's going on? Yet, the polling data tell us that very few people feel like we're in a recovery. Here's the reason. The reason we were in a bubble is because up to 2008, if you drew a trend line back to 1960, portfolio growth and income growth more than kept pace with our tuition increases. Okay? So even if your income didn't go up, your investments did, and so you felt affluent enough you might not have liked writing that check for an extra 6%, but you could because the money was there in your account. That was a 40-something year run where that held true. Income and portfolio growth. Since 2008, income's been flat, and on net, most people have experienced a loss in their portfolio, even though it comes back from time to time, and then the market loses another 500 points. But the psychology of those four and 500 point drops in the market is devastating. The psychology of it is more impactful than the economic reality of it, the raw dollars lost. People feel like they're losing more than they actually are. So we have now the double whammy on the trifecta on the screen of people feel less affluent, and they are less affluent in a lot of ways. The second piece that was driving that is more kids. We have fewer kids now. This rise. So our options. So, gee, now I've dug a deep hole. How do we get out of it? I don't know. We're all in it. So ju jump in there with us. Let's see. Um, we can take ism at their word, and we can just keep on increasing prices. And we can aim at the people who can pay. That's my understanding of ism's model. In fact, they're their famous paper on the subject is full speed ahead. And their thesis is there will always be enough families to afford independent school. By the way, I agree. I don't think the independent school sector is in any danger of disappearing. I think we'll survive. We'll just look different than we did. But if you take them at their word, we'll survive and we will be a school for the one half of the 1% if you play that out to its logical extreme. And if you're in a market like New York, or Atlanta or LA, you could probably get away with it and not be hurt that bad on enrollment. Or if you're in Philly, some schools could probably do it be sh and shrink, be much smaller than they are, and still have a market. But there'd be really a different kind of place right now. And that's a conversation to, to be having in there. Is, 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 is that an acceptable scenario? I think. I have gone to a couple of schools in the last year that have said, yes, that would be an acceptable scenario for us. Most schools would say, no, that would not be. We don't have the diversity. We don't have the kind of community we want. But understanding that one is important. Increased philanthropy. That's uh, the NAIS solution. Pat Bassett's now a friend and now business partner in a joint venture. Uh, to increase philanthropy. It's a, it's a, a, no, a laudable goal. Well, I'm, I'm all for that. But it's really hard to do, particularly in your small elementary schools. So even before you said alumni giving in the elementary school, we already had this on the slide, particularly in small elementary schools. It's tough in every sector right now. There's more people competing for the dollars out there, for, for donations. Incre increase non-tuition revenue. Man, this is the holy grail 
You're right, isn't it? You know? and, and we've been about as successful in, in finding non-tuition revenue. Uh, so we have that. If you go look on the NAIS website and you pull down that PowerPoint they got of the 15 schools that have done things that have generated significant non-tuition revenue, it's now probably six or eight years old. If you look at every one of them, they share something in common. They have a highly unique, very leverageable, customized asset that they can sell. They got two hockey rinks and NHL coaches that come in the summer and do very high-end hockey camps that parents will pay a gazillion dollars for their kids to go if they aspire for them to be in the NHL. Sorry, that's Culver Academy in Indiana that does that. They make a ton out of that program. You got two hockey rinks, you got NHL coaches hanging out in your backyard, you know, that, that's a, not something you replicate very easily. They got an ocean next door so they can do some kind of high-end sea adventuring or, or a marine biology program that's, that's closely adjacent. Well, it's a, you know, Mississippi River marine biology doesn't work too well, Delaware River probably not much better. So I, I think that's one of the reasons. I'm all for non-tuition revenue. I'm just not for betting the farm on that one because we just, too many people have formed too many task forces that have spent too much time getting nowhere. We can deliver more value. Well, it's still subject to price point re resistance, but it might give us a little bit longer runway. And, it, it, and with a couple of other things, delivering more value might be a piece of so, a conversation about value proposition has to come into your solution as well. What's it going to be and how do we all get joined on what we're going to be offering because part of the value proposition gets tied to productivity. Well, we will offer more. If you offer more with more adults providing it, you've lost. That's the thing. And that's what we've done for the past 40 years. The, the numbers are striking. You know, the, the, we, we've gotten worse in 40 years. We have many, many more adults producing many, many fewer students than we did uh, in the past. Find a new cheaper delivery model uh, or embrace, I'm saying embrace your inner industrialist. Figure out how we could do this if we were trying to produce something at the lowest cost. You know, a few years ago, people in this industry talked about something that nobody did, yet it's a fascinating experiment. What price point would we want to be at, not free, but what would we say would be a reasonable price point to be at? And what would we have to engineer to get there? What would our building, our program, our plan, our strategy, everything we do, what would it have to look like to get us to that price point? You know, that's how, and I, I know I'm not, I don't work with for-profit companies. I don't work in manufacturing. That's not my space. I know we've got financial services people here, probably on boards, but certainly never, that's not my space. But this is how you'd do it if you were a car company. If you were Toyota, you would say, we want cars at this price point, this price point, this price point, and this price point, and how do we, you know, what kind of, what, how do we engineer a car that can be built at each of those price points? It means trade-offs, it means material changes, it means things, but that has to be done. I'll tell you a guy who's doing it right now. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna tout him. I'm not gonna say this is the model to take. It's just interesting to look at. Sonny Varkey, you know the GEMS Academies? Do we have GEMS Academies around here? G-E-M-S, Global Edu, stands for Global Education Management Service. It's his family business. They've got about 170 schools worldwide right now. So in Dubai, an interesting anomaly. For those of the school business, this is worth hearing. In Dubai, uh, there is no public school system. None at all. Dubai. There's no taxes either. Everything, even trash, everything is a la carte. You pay for everything. So the, the downside of not having taxes is you pay for everything. So school, you have to pay for it. You want your kids to go to school, you have to pay for it. So what Sonny did was go into uh, to Dubai and set up 10 schools at 10 different price points. He'll give you a, you know, equivalent of uh, Exeter Groton boarding school education at an Exeter Groton boarding school price. He'll give you a Penn Charter education in a Penn Charter price. He will give you a parochial school quality education at a parochial school price. He will give you a 50 student to one teacher ratio education at $1,000 a student price all the way down the scale. But literally, he's engineered a ladder of what it would take to hit those price points. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying it's a thing. 
and that, that's one approach to getting, he's had to sit down with his team on that question of what price point do we want to hit and how do we hit it? What would it take? And at least have that conversation so you understand what, where your degrees of freedom are. I'm going to advocate it. I think it's an interesting one that someone's pulled it off. By the way, as far as I can tell in the whole world, he's one of the very few players in for-profit education that's actually made money at it. It's interesting. Okay, I said it's mind wear. So for me, this is, this is some of your big takeaways. A uh, couple, three, three shifts, three, three thought changes I think we've got to make. One, accept that our pre-2008 enrollment was a bubble, not our normal baseline. We're not going back there at all likelihood, not for a very long time. Maybe if we go back to lots of kids growing and our you know, families having many, many kids again. There is an antidote to that that we have so far almost totally missed. And that's attracting the populations that are now moving into the U.S. And they are largely, beginning with the Hispanic wave, largely still missing from our schools. So as Dreadful as many of our schools have done on biracial, uh, white, black kind of diversity in our culture, we've really missed the ball on the Hispanic immigration, and we're still missing it big time. And that's, that's going to be death for us in a lot of urban markets in this country. But assuming that we have to stay with our current demography, if we have to stay with our current customer, it's not our normal baseline. Fully understand the degree to which your school is in the retail business. Yep. The retail business is Nordstrom. Is there Nord there's a Nordstrom here, isn't there, out at the King of Prussia? Yeah, okay. So you got, um, everyone knows where King of Prussia is, right? That's the, the big mall. So the retail business, Nordstrom sells shirts at retail. You don't go to Nordstrom and say, I want to buy shirt, and Nordstrom says that'll be $125 for a shirt. I'm death on shirts, so I'm not going to pay $125 for a shirt. They'll say, Go buy $125 for a shirt, and you say, I can't afford it. They'll say, then you can't buy it, right? Or come back, and we run a sale, maybe they'll still be here, but, but you can't buy it. They're in the retail business. They got to make it back on every customer, one way or another. Some of our schools are essentially, many of our schools, maybe most NAIS schools are essentially in the retail business. In fact, if you run the endowment numbers, on NAIS member day schools. Strip out the boarding schools because they, they're the curve wreckers of the endowment world. Strip them out. If you just run that number on endowment, it's worth doing because you'll see some really interesting things there. It's a hockey stick on an invert. It's an inverted hockey stick. You got a tiny number of schools that have huge endowments. You know, 80 million, 100 million, 265 million. There aren't many. There's maybe a half a dozen to a, to a dozen up there. In fact, I would argue if you look at the numbers, there's only about 15 that have endowments that really would help them much. You know, just help them die less quickly, but that would help them really constructively. Only maybe 15, maybe 20 at the top in the day school universe. That's out of about eight, 900,000 day schools. So that, that's not, the, the, in, the endowment piece, my, most of us are in the retail business is the bottom line. Some of us have some degrees of freedom for flexibility because we have endowments, we have resources to draw on, we have, if we're, if we're lucky and we have those non-tuition revenue streams, but getting an accurate grasp of are we in the retail business or to what degree are we in the retail business I think is critical for boards and administrations. We've tended to behave as if we weren't when in fact many of us were all along. We just weren't realizing it. And now that things are tighter, we're feeling the squeeze on being in the retail business. I think we've also, and I put this in mind where for a reason. You could put this in to do's, which would be the next list. But mind where I think we've got to get serious about quality. Forgive me for this for a moment. I'm going to bring you some feedback. We do focus groups in schools all the time. We've done focus groups in at least eight schools in Advis land uh, within the past three or four years. I'll put that together with a few thousand focus groups we've done over the year, and I'll tell you what the single biggest parent complaint about private independent schools is. There isn't a close number two. Any idea? 
What's the single biggest complaint? You know, you'd think it would be communication, because that's everybody. But actually, as much as we hear about communication, communication was that far distant number two. What was number one? Quality. Variations in quality. It wasn't the aggregate quality. It was the variation in quality. It was the fact that third grade teachers weren't as strong as second or fourth. It was the fact that the math program ended discontinu between lower school and middle school discontinuously, either way, or that the language program was discontinuous and kids were having to kind of restart or lose a year. So what you said, well, on the whole, how's the quality? Oh, it's great on the whole. But man, in that, you know, that here's the point. That quality hiccup, and when we go to heads of school, forgive me, heads of school, I have to say that no one in the room would be one of those, really. I haven't done this to anyone in the room, so I'm not picking on anyone. When we tend to go to heads of school and say, we hear overwhelmingly that you got a quality issue here around the math program going into middle school. It all evens out, but that's a you know, hellish couple, three years for kids to get through. The heads of school tend to say, yeah, well, at least it evens out. You know, it works out okay in the end. Okay? Well, 40 years ago, that was cool enough. It worked. Today, I think it's all got to be there. Our schools have to really get serious about our thinking process around quality and perfecting the product. I know we're working with biological organisms in students and families that don't behave. I know there's variation that's built into that, but we've got to figure out what piece of our product variation we can control and control the hell out of it. Because if we don't do that, we die on these minor variations because when families are scrimping to pay us, that's what gets the brand loyalty. They go looking someplace else when they think that middle school isn't so hot around here. So really getting serious about product quality. Sorry, I know that's kind of inside the family. We do it too. We had to do it too. We had to do it at our school a few years ago. We had to face up to the fact that our middle school stank. Be, be, be straight up about that. It did. I mean, I think like the administration and board were the last people on the planet to figure this out about the school. But it really did, and it was time to get serious about it and fix it. Now, since we fixed it, we have a waiting list. But you, you're not going to do anything until you realize, yes, quality has to be there. And our view was, well, hell, middle school is just a tadpole stage of human development anyway. You know, you just live through it to get to high school. And look at what our high school does. Our high school hits it out of the park. And our families were leaving for middle school. Some of them came back for high school. But many didn't. They found a new home. So I think quality is it. Mind wear around quality is something we, we haven't tended to take that very seriously. Strategies. <sighs> Broadly, I, I think you, you know, if you think about where to go, and this is another talk to have with your board, where, where do we fall on this one? You could narrow. So I got a bunch of friends together that do this work in industry. They do you know, with other kinds of companies and other nonprofits. We said, what would be our strategies? And they said, well, we could narrow. Narrow could be one of two or three things. Narrow could be be a smaller school, shrink. If you go to the Chronicle of Higher Education and you dig around on there, you'll find a recent article on the benefits of being a smaller college, the shrinking as a strategy. It's something education's talking about across the board. But by the way, you think our enrollments stink? You should see theirs. You take out the top 50 most selective colleges in the country, everybody else is down massively. So it's, it's a real, real, there are empty seats all over the place in higher ed. They're just maldistributed. They're not in the Ivy Leagues. You could also decide that you want to be a boutique. We'll narrow our mission. We'll narrow our focus. We'll narrow our scope. We'll be less things for fewer people. We'll, we'll pull it in a bit. We'll be, we'll be more of a rifle shot than a shotgun. We'll be a specialist in something. We won't just be the STEM school. We will be a STEM school. That will be our play. We won't just be a language school. We'll go full on deep immersion, the whole nine yards, guaranteeing fluency. I, I'm making it up as I go here. But narrowing could apply to shrinking and program. We will get more focused. We will grow. You could, you could do that if you think you can. You can expand uh, beyond your reach. 
you could say, we will figure out how to get kids 50 miles to us. Uh, we, will f we will see if we can overcome the barrier that parents have about sending their small kids distances. Or maybe we'll double down high school where parents are willing to schlep their kids across vast geographies to get them to us. But we'll figure out how to grow the geography. Now, the bottom line to that is you can't all do it. Because if you do, there's, you're just growing over top of each other. There's not going to be enough room. Someone's still going to lose in that proposition. But there may be some room in here for a few schools to try a growth strategy. Woodward Academy in Atlanta. Anybody know Atlanta geography here? You know Atlanta? So you know where Woodward is. Where are they? Way, way south, down by the airport. About half of their students come from north of the perimeter highway in Sandy Springs, Roswell, Gwinnett, heading up to where the population growth has gone on. They either put them on the trains going through town to get to school, or they bring them down on buses. They figured out a way of doing that. That's Atlanta. That may not play here. It wouldn't play for every school. But if your demography is constrained, then that's you know, then growing. You can partner or merge. The more together than we are apart scenario. Now, there's a piece in the partner merge piece that uh, has a bit of an edge to it, by the way. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this, so I have to get uh, forgiveness from you for saying some things that may, may be painful, but I'll, I'll go there. Partner and merge, to me, is preferable to close. And I think what happens if we wait too long to execute that strategy is we end up losing an opportunity to preserve the essence of our mission by moving it into an organization together with which we could be viable. So in St. Louis, where I live, I think I can make a very strong case today that there should be two fewer schools. And I'm absolutely convinced that they will wait until two schools die before they do that. When I would think there's at least two I could identify today that should go to another school and say, let me give you our assets, let's do the, the right thing here, and then we can still get the benefits of that. So some mergers can be uh, strategies just to keep the, the DNA alive, if you will, rather than uh, to, to actually keep the school going as, a, as an entity. But you can partner or merge. I don't know that we need 45 independent schools in St. Louis. We don't. That's how many we got, 45 independent schools in that little town. You know, we don't need 45. We don't need pre-K. We've got three private independent pre-K-6 schools within two blocks of each other. I know, my son went to one of them. I was on its board for six years. Several of us on the board tried to nudge it towards merger. You know, come on, we, got, we, we buddy up. We, our campus was terrific for early childhood. Man, we had a great building for early childhood. The other school had a great building for older kids. This is a natural. Nah, board members, nah, can't do it. They're not us, they're different. You know, how different are they? They're a block away. We're yeah. friends, we all go out together. Partnering, merging. Other, you could try something like a pedagogical shift. You could, uh, you know, the design, learn, design thinking, design learning thing is the big rage right now. STEM was a couple of years. You can jump on something that you think is going to be the next pedagogical bandwagon. That's a strategy, and if, if you can find one that works, it will work, but it will have a shelf life. And the, and the reason for that is inherent in the idea that there is no such thing as a sustainable competitive advantage. If it works for you, someone will copy it down the street. And there goes the competitive advantage in time. But it may get you a, a few years. You may need to do something like that at the time being. So I'm working with a school right now that has a dying elementary school, has a high school and middle school that are doing really quite well. The high school in particular is a girl's school. It is doing fabulously. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll phenomenon. Lower school's languishing. They have a early childhood program that's an AMI Montessori program that is going gangbusters. 100% of those families leave to go to other Montessori schools, and then the kids, you know, have to come in new for a very traditional, to me, this is a no-brainer. Go Montessori. Do a Montessori all the way to eight and, and build a through train because it's, at least you're going to be pedagogically consistent and you can hang on to some people. So 
don't discount this one completely. There may be some plays in the pedagogy or, or academic model that will work, work for you. Uh, IB is probably not it, but we can unpack that one another day. Uh, that's, that's what I always assess. Back, back to this. I, I think there's three things you can do with the data here. You can go back to your board and say, uh, wow, went to this talk, heard this guy say that our demography looks like demography in lots of places. It's not terrific. It's going downhill. Uh, where are we? What's our trend line? Let's do our 20-year enrollment horizon. Look at it. Understand. It. What are our degrees of freedom around this? What do we need to be thinking about? Do we need to be thinking about shrinking? Do we need to be thinking about focusing? Do we need to be thinking about whether we expand our geography? And we, then you really have to sit back at it and say, maybe we would need a play. How long a runway do we have? Can we afford a Hail Mary kind of play here? Do we, is this a, it has to work or we die? Or can we have the space to try a few things? If you have the space to try a few things, then I think you pick which experiments you want to run here. Maybe a pedagogical shift, maybe a geography play. Maybe you start building out your business model to think about what price point you want to hit and how you, how you occupy that. But these are all conversations that boards need to begin having right now. Here's my belief, and I'm not just saying this because it's the end of the talk and, and I, I need to wrap up on a point. I think it is the strength of our industry that we have to fall back on. What makes private independent schools great, why we still have them. How old are you, Finn Charter? 326 years. Uh, why we still have them 326 years on at, at Penn Charter, and why we have them for several centuries before that in the UK, is because we've got a lot of experiments running every day. The benefit to our redundancy, school to school, is that we get to try a lot of stuff. So I think that's been what's kept us alive for 326 years, is we've been able to try enough stuff that others then emulate that we've stayed going through all kinds of calamities and changes. I believe, I'm taking a biologically evolutionary perspective in this, that I believe that all the schools in Advis land, the 1,300 NAIS member schools, trying different stuff will come up with ways of living with this and surviving. But we probably will not look the way we've looked in the past and maybe that's the big piece of mind where we have to adapt, is that what we've called school for a very long time may not perfectly look like school in the future. It may for some of us, but not for all of us. Questions, comments? Um, provoked anything? Ticked off anybody? What are they? Please. Denise. Uh, uh, go to Chronicle of Higher Education and go to the search thing and put in a shrinkage uh, or shrinking as a strategy or something like that. Uh, a, a lot of um, smaller liberal arts colleges have had to go here. So, you know, if you start in the western part of Iowa and you go to the eastern border of Ohio, there is just a thicket of small liberal arts colleges. The ones that are doing well are, are, are sustaining themselves have largely managed to be smaller places still. They've managed to be 50 students less or 100 students less. I'm not talking about the uh, Denisons and Oberlins. I'm talking about maybe the kind of the, by reputation, by name identification next to you down. Uh, state universities are, are going through this in, in multiples. Uh, what they've had to, and the state universities are more constrained, but the small liberal art colleges have, have largely found ways around that other than the sweet briars and the, the famous examples like those. It, it has probably meant, um, what they, what, you'll see the quality issue come up. They, they really had to get serious about teacher evaluation and dealing with uh, uh, the fa famous tenure problems. They've had to get very serious about their geography and about where they recruit from. And they've had to hone their value proposition to a sharp edge. They've got to be very clear about exactly what it is you get if you come here. Um, yes, send me an email and I will send you some names because I just did some work for a, a university. We have a few higher ed clients, not many, uh, that had just dreadful productivity. And we were looking at their benchmarks. I mean, colleges have terrible, these guys really had bad productivity. 
we looked at their benchmarks and there were a lot of schools in there that had found ways of, of leveraging it. Uh, it, had, it requires thinking about your compensation model differently uh, because they, you know, we, we're not going go to go to, to, to incentive pay, but there's ways of uh, bonusing people for doing more. The, for, and, and then the thing of doing more isn't just, okay, I'm going to, you know, advise more students. We're going to figure out how to do more that actually brings in money. Yes? Mm -hmm. Uh, absolutely, it, it's uh, it's bimodal. It's the top and the bottom. So if you if you look in the buy, you've got the um, income's very high. You have uh, tons of tons of people putting their families in the uh, putting their kids in the upper end schools, the higher price schools, and you got the uh, largely Pakistani, uh, Urdu speaking um, uh, laborers that are building Dubai. That kids are in the lower price point, and there's a whole boatload of them, more than a boatload. So you got tons of them. And, and those two fill up. What doesn't do so well is the middle. And if you think about our markets, it tends to be that way kind of as well in a lot of our markets. But yeah, it is that. It's been the top and the bottom. I, it'll be interesting to see what, what they do when, they're, when they, they've opened a couple of gym schools in Malaysia. Uh, I don't know if they're going to follow a similar approach to, the, to price tiering there, but the, it was a natural here because there was really no option of a public alternative. Yes, yeah, sorry, right next to your hand up. The, the data behind it was if you, if you look at enrollment grew marginally, but at a, at a steady rate over that six, ne never a lot. We were always 1% of market share in the U.S. But if you looked at a market was growing, so our aggregate numbers, were, our total numbers were growing. Uh, if you look at support in terms of annual giving and uh, capital giving and take out correct for inflation, that saw a very sharp growth over that period of time, uh, which has largely leveled off or declined since. So there were a number of indicators that would suggest that those were our halcyon days uh, of, of growth and prosperity that, that at some stage had to correct because it, uh, unless the, the fundamentals that were driving them corrected. And that's also the only comparably long period in U.S. history where we had anything like the income growth and portfolio growth that we saw during that interval. You can't, my friends that study this stuff tell me you can't find another 50-year interval that looks like that 50-year interval. It, it, sooner or later, there was a massive correction calamity. Even though we had recessions, uh, we came back. Even though we had the Vietnam War, somehow we got, you know, we got through it, and we managed to get back on a growth cycle relatively quickly. What's happening now is that we've had a correction and we're not getting back on that growth cycle again in the same way. Wages haven't come pace. Mm -hmm. You're right, I think, if we can argue numbers, if you look at the total numbers, if you look at the distribution of the numbers, it looks different. So the, you're, you're right, the total amount of wealth has returned, but it's more skewed uh, toward a smaller number of families. You, you look at the income, the growth has been, in income has been, where, no, where incomes are growing have been skewed towards certain occupations and away from others that used to be the meat and potatoes of a lot of our schools. So if you look at uh, what we used to call in this country the upper middle class, for want of something better, uh, that's the group that hasn't largely rebounded from this. What's happened is that the higher income class has rebounded really, really well. And that's offset the other. But if you look specifically at, at the bread and butter customer 
of private independent schools. Uh, in St. Louis, the bread and butter customer was the Washington University faculty member in the humanities that saved and scrimped and, and sacrificed and sent their kid to uh, a private independent school even though they were on a faculty member's salary. That salary has not come back. Uh, if you're unlucky enough to be teaching at a state university, you probably haven't had a raise in the last 10 years, um, at least five or six years. So there's, there's a whole band of customers that were, Look at, look at what's happened largely in medical salaries. Uh, you've got a handful of medical specialties that are getting paid more now than they've ever gotten paid. They're rock stars. They're, they're for sale to the highest bidder. And you've got your pediatricians and orthopedists and other people, sorry if there's any in the room, that have, have largely not getting the benefits of that. In fact, have seen reductions while they've seen their costs go up. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, to me, it's the trifecta. I could go back to that slide of the convergence of three factors that create this, the storm we've got. It, one or another may be more present in your market. The problem we have, though, is with our production model. If, we, if price is our problem, the production model is what's getting us there. If, uh, in, if we don't have enough people to pay the product at any price, then we have a demography. We, wherever we go with this, we have a different problem we have to deal with. Part of your job is to diagnose what are the factors in, in your market that might lead you to a solution. Yeah, over here. Oh, sure, I'm seeing uh, school districts start private foundations to raise money philanthropically to support them. I'm seeing pro public schools with annual giving campaigns uh, because the, uh, the Incorporated Parents Association, independent of the school, as a 501c3 to, to raise money on behalf of the school to support extras, and uh, absolutely. They, they've got some of the same constraints we have on a per-pupil basis, and they're reaching for some of the same tools that, that we've used. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, what my office sits in a, um, a school district that, has, that charges, you, you can go there to pay tuition, and you could get an education that's arguably on par with the independent schools. The ratio is going to look a lot alike, uh, and they charge a lot less than the independent schools would charge. Um, other schools, districts in St. Louis County would love to do that same thing. They just stink, so they can't. They, no one would go there and pay. But I, I think wherever you have a district that has a few little extra capacity and the ability to absorb that at, without adding marginal cost, they're going to go for it. Thank you. 
couple guys. So people have no choice. You either leave them in school or they have no choice but to leave the system. So that's a sad thing to say. But I don't think there's any incentive for us to pay children to go to school. The only system is the one that's corrupt. So maybe we contact and make a meeting with these people. But the model is to make sure you get the same treatment. The cost of counseling is differently and the system is audited. Uh, I agree with you, Daryl. Th that's really what I was talking about when I said that the schools that could change the model have no incentive to because they're under the least pressure and they have the longest runways. The schools that have the most incentive because their runway, they're, they're looking at some, some horizon, really can't because they don't have the market standing. That's why the whole thing sits pretty constant out there. Uh, there is no more conservative decision that human beings make than how to educate their kids. Uh, that's small c conservative, not politically, con uh, it's a weird year, right? So it's not that, uh, but we're, we're all cautious with that. I, my, my favorite example, forgive me the little story here, but uh, when I was a, a relatively new board member at Wildwood, I was at a parent event and I was talking to a parent in the school uh, who was telling me, what he want, I, you know, what he was looking for from the school, and we weren't providing it. He was, he loved the school, but he said, you know, this would have been so much better. We need uniforms at this school. We, we really do. We need uniforms. Hey, we are as far left a school as you can get on the. We are the left most leaning school in the left most zip code in the United States. It's it's pretty far out there, and our kids are too. You know, we're we're you know. Multiculturalism was the founding, founding ethos of the school way back. So, well, wait a minute, uniforms, what's this? He said, yeah, like a parochial school, you know, like the Catholic school. Uh, okay, cool. What else? He said, well, you know, we gotta have desks. N none, of this, none of this modular furniture crap. You know, get us desks. Go, going through this whole thing, I finally said, wow, you know, this sounds like 1950, 1955. And he said, yeah, that's it. I'm out here living in this crazy city. I'm, I'm living this out there lifestyle, but I want my kids to grow up like they're in Toledo. Now, that guy was Gene Simmons, the lead singer in Kiss. <laughs> I, I didn't go further with unpacking that, I just left it there. But even, even him was fundamentally conservative about what, and what his notion was, I don't want to mess with my kids when it comes to education. The, the thing I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this buy very conservatively. I'd like it to look, you know, predict, that kind of thing. What I'm suggesting though is that some of the factors, if, if you could take one data dispute, another piece of data dispute, some of the factors that have kept us from facing the abyss have gone away. And I don't think we're all going to stay free of having to face it. Some schools, yes. Other schools, no. And I think we are coming up to the point where some schools, if we can't figure out the pricing model or the productivity model or something, some schools are going to be looking at fewer options. I know that's been predicted for a very long time. Uh, it's always happened traumatically with schools. What I'm suggesting is that we're going to have to figure this out as an industry now because I don't think we're going to come back to a time where suddenly we're going to have families falling out of trees ready to pay this tuition. That's my thesis. Yeah, sorry. Last question. Yeah. Uh, often, that's been boys and girls schools, you know, that uh, there have been a few that have done that. Um, some have done it under duress. Uh, others have done it thoughtfully and, and planfully. Uh, that, that's, that's a tough one because there's, there's always that, you know, that notion that someone does, if someone doesn't want to give up being single gender and the alumni go ballistic and that kind of thing. Um, there have been schools that have done it uh, to, to get facility advantages. Uh, because somebody has one set of facilities and somebody has another. We've seen that happen a few times. But again, think about it. In all of the world of, of businesses out there, 
mergers coming together, going apart is a normal part of activity. It's very rare in our space. And uh, the, the idea I'm planting, comparatively rare, I'm planting out there is if we viewed that as a strategic tool, it would be one more trick uh, that we would have at our disposal if we thought about is there a natural synergy? Is there a natural advantage? That's all I'm saying, just planting that out there. And, uh, anything else I can cover very quickly? Well, thank you all. I, I hope I provoke something. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Thank oh, wow. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You're too kind. Thank you. Enjoy having dinner. I'll join you. Yes. So uh, I asked Mark to be provocative, and I know he certainly was. Lots of food for thought, for discussion here, and back in your boardroom. So Mark, thank you very much. Um, we are now ready for dinner. And as you see, we have a buffet. Uh, I want to remind you all, I don't think you're all currently sitting at the table on your name tag. So if you would check your name tag and regroup where you're sitting for dinner, that way we'll make sure we have everyone seated comfortably. Um, I want to welcome Michael Gary. He has arrived. Michael, thank you for joining us this evening. We're very pleased to welcome you. And I also want to apologize that I overlooked Margaret Fox Tully, who is the new incoming head of school at Holy Child Academy. So Margaret, welcome to you too. And so please start dinner. And I think at around 8 o'clock, Jeffrey Rosen will join us and, and for a few remarks. Thank you.